Again, I appreciate the uh, presence of everyone here tonight and, and those who are certainly interested in the message of the prophets. I believe that it, the message that was presented by these prophets to a erring and recalcitrant nation of Israel and Judah for that matter is as uh, germane and pertinent today to this country and, and to other countries as well but to this country also and we'll see especially when we get into Hosea we'll see that any nation that has a disregard for the truth of God's word and lives according to that disregard, that nation cannot long survive. Now when I say long, it's not long in terms of our years. It may be uh, hundreds of years, but nevertheless, there will be, will be a marked decline in that nation. And I think we're seeing it today. Uh, and it's happened very rapidly, as a matter of fact, within a generation. But nevertheless, uh, we're still in Amos, and uh, Amos, as we have mentioned before, is a very stern individual. He had a very uh, uh, disciplined outlook on life and owing probably to the uh, you know the profession that he had that being a, a tender of sheep and and also sycamore trees it was a hard life <laughs> and that's why he looked at life and he told things as it was and he, there's no pretenses about him and he was not all love and sweetness and what have you. He told it like it was. He had no regard for the feelings. He was going to tell you the truth. But anyway, we left off in chapter 7. We uh, had this, uh, these visions that, that uh, Amos had. We had the visions of the locusts. And we had already talked about locusts before, how they really just destroyed everything and and uh, Amos prayed that uh, the Lord wouldn't visit the people with the destruction of the locusts. And so it said the Lord relented, shall not be. And then they had the uh, uh, vision of the uh, uh, plumb line. They eventually got down the plumb line. And he didn't say he was going to relent from that one. The plumb line is, is a device. Most of you know what a plumb line is with a plumb bob on it. You can tell with something is straight up and down. So you can tell with somebody something is straight up and down, and you can also get the level by the measures, but you've got to have that, that uh, whatever it is, straight up and down. And... Uh, used his plumb line, found that Israel was not <laughs> straight up and down. And he didn't say he was going to to uh, forgive that. So when he had gotten through declaring the implication of that vision, then Amaziah the priest here in verse 10, uh, he's a priest, a priest of Bethel, which means he was a, an idolatrous priest, he sent to Jeroboam king, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the uh, house of Israel. And they, the, na the land or the nation of Israel is not able to hear all of his words. Well, the, the fact of the matter is they didn't like the words they were hearing. Now, what Amos could not do is deny the accusations from from uh, Amaziah because it was true. What Amaziah was saying was true. But Amos had a retort to what uh, Amos, 
as I had said, said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. And when we get into Hosea, we'll see, uh, I'll uh, read to you some of the political goings on at that time, and you'll see where all these people were killed. Then after uh, Amaziah, uh, or Amos said that, Amaziah said, go you seer. Now seer is just another word for a prophet. Go you seer, flee to the land of Judah. And that's where Amos was from. There eat bread and, and there prophesy. Now I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that Hezekiah, Amaziah was not all that concerned about the welfare of Amos that he would, you know, have plenty to eat. He just wanted him to go to his own land and prophesy. And it almost has the implication that uh, Amos was doing this for money. He could go to uh, Judah and prophesy and get the money to buy food and this, that, and the other. But he said, never again prophesied Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. It is a royal residence. <clears throat> and Amos said, I, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of the prophet. You know, back in that time, they had these, if you want to call them professional prophets, you know, famous prophets. They prophesied for money. Uh, Amos is saying, I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm not a prophet, and I wasn't the son of a prophet. So I was a herdsman and a tender of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So therefore, he had to do it. It wasn't something that he just uh, planned on doing. So once having said that, he said to uh, Amaziah, now, therefore, since I've established the fact that I'm not a prophet, I, I'm not getting paid for this, and I'm not a family of prophets, and I'm just a herdsman. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Lord, so that means it's going to happen, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall defile a die in a defiled land. And Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. And these things came to pass. And there was another vision beginning chapter 8. It's the vision of the summer fruit. And he asked Amos, what do you see? He said, a basket of summer fruit. Now, summer fruit is a fruit that's ripe. Maybe a little bit overripe. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel, just as the fruit, you know, the summer fruit, the end is, it's rotting. Uh, so is Israel. The end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. And, and here we have this terminology, pass by them anymore, as, a, as opposed to pass uh, over them or pass through them. That's not going to happen. It's not going to pass through them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies, bodies everywhere and they shall throw them out in silence. Songs of the temple are just uh, the, uh, it wasn't uh, religious songs uh, per se, it was just the, the mirth that was taking place in the temple, which shouldn't have been, but it, that's what was happening. But that's gonna to turn to, to wailing. What's gonna to happen to Israel is gonna cause that songs of mirth to turn into wailing. 
and there are going to be many dead bodies uh, everywhere. There are going to be so many, in fact, that they can't give them a proper burial, and they're just going to pile them up and throw them out. And there's not going to be any ceremony. There's, they've got to get rid of the bodies, so they'll just take them out and, and dump them. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. And that's, of course, what they were doing. And this is a false uh, religion that they had uh, evidenced. When will a new moon be passed that we may sell grain? They had that, a lot of outward manifestations of religion, but they were just itching to get these uh, little ceremonies over with so they could get back to selling and, and uh, defrauding the poor and whatever, whatever it was to get uh, personal gain. And the Sabbath that we may trade our wheat. It was an inconvenience for them to have to, have to even though it was a false worship, to, to have to participate in this worship because it took away from the things that they really wanted to do, and that was to make money for themselves. They made the ephah small and the shekel large. In other words, they, they were cheating. <laughs> they were defrauding the people falsifying the balances by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. You know, sandals didn't cost much, but they were buying the needy for a pair of sandals. Even the bad wheat, they were selling that as good wheat to the poor. They were still defrauding the poor. Then the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Now, who's the pride of Jacob? Well, of course, there are various uh, opinions of that, but pride of Jacob should have been Jehovah himself. And the Lord cannot swear by anybody greater than himself. So he's sworn by the pride of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their works. Indeed, that is the case. God knows all works, good and bad, and he will not forget any of them. Shall the land not tremble for this, for the evil that they've done, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? Think about an uh, earthquake. How it shakes the land. Nobody can escape it. All of it shall swell like the river. That's I'm talking about the Nile River. And if you know anything about the Nile, and that's the time before they built a, what they call the uh, Aswan Dam, it used to flood every spring or whenever the rains came up in the uh, center of Africa. It would come down, and it would flood all the fields. And, of course, that brought silt. And that was a way to fertilize the fields. But when they built the uh, high Aswan Dam, that all ended. But of course, they certainly didn't have that back then. So, this uh, when the river flooded, it flooded everything. You couldn't avoid it. All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. So, this destruction is going to be uh, cover everything, and it shall come pass in that day. Says the Lord God. Well, what day is that? The day He's talking about. <clears throat> that I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. That doesn't mean that it, that's actually going to happen, but he has the power to make it happen. So what he, what he is saying is, when I say that I'm going to do this, I've got the power to do it and I'm going to do it. I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast in, into morning and all your songs and lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist, and sackcloth was a uh, manifestation of grief and baldness on every head. They're not going to be have you know, their heads covered. I will make it like mourning for an only son. And back at that time, sons were very important 
you know, they, families desired sons. So if there was one son in the family and that son died, that was a devastating event. And it's end uh, like a bitter day. And verse 11 says, Behold, the days are coming that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a hearing of the words of God. When all this uh, devastation comes upon the people, they're going to want to hear something from the Lord that there's going to be relief. You're not going to hear it. You may want to hear the words of the Lord, but you're not going to hear it. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord. You're not going to hear anything. But they're not, they shall not find it, as he says here. In that day, the fair virgins and the strong men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Don't look for those places for salvation. It's not going to happen. Beersheba, by the way, was down in Judah, but it was a center of uh, idolatry by this time, too. So don't look for those places for the Word of God. You're not going to find it. In verse 9, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. And, of course, the question is, what altar was he standing by? We're talking about... Uh, Israel and they they call that place of worship in Bethel. So was the Lord standing by the altar in Bethel? The only problem with, with that that was a uh, not an authorized place of worship only Jerusalem. And also Bethel had a lot of altars. Which one? So yeah, that's a symbolic thing saying that. Uh, uh, the Lord was standing in the place of authority. And he's saying, strike the doorpost at the thresholds, the thresholds, must shake the thresholds, or the, the bottom plate, if you will, and, and the doorpost of the things that stand up, and break them on, on the heads of them all. So it's going to be destroyed. He who flees, uh, I will slay the, the last of them with a sword, he who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Again, talking about the devastation that's going to come upon Israel. <clears throat> Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, which is very wooded and uh, craggy and a lot of uh, boulders and what have you, but very wooded. From there I will search and take them, though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea. From there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity, uh, captivity for their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and I will slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. The judgment of the Lord cannot be avoided. No matter what the people do, the judgment of the Lord is going to be executed on these people. The Lord God of hosts, you know, when we talk about hosts, we're talking about uh, army and what have you. He who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like a river. Again, that's Nile, and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky, the clouds and what have you, has found the strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He, he has control of all this. He is the Lord of nature and the Lord of everything. So when he says something, it's going to happen. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O oh, children of Israel? Ethiopians were the most southern heathen nation. Uh, o oh, children of Israel, did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, Philistines from 
Kaftor and the Syrians from Kerr. Did he bring these people? So, you know, what, what are you? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. There's going to be a remnant, says the Lord. For surely I will command in the house, uh, I will sift the house of Israel from among the nations as grain is sifted in the sea. There's not going to be, everybody's not going to be destroyed. There's going to be a, a remnant. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. So they were not all sinners. Most of them were. Who say the calamity shall not overtake us nor confront us. Well, it did. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repaired its damages. And I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. This, this particular section, again, uh, as I always say with the prophets, always will offer hope. And this has to be a, a messianic in, in uh, nature because you're talking about the tabernacle of David. It can't be the physical tabernacle of David. It's the spiritual tabernacle of David because, of, you know, the, the rebuilt temple was, a, was destroyed again. I will rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Now, I've often wondered, uh, given the messianic nature of this and the fact that he mentions the Gentiles are also going to be called by my name, and in fact, that did come to pass because they were called Christians first at Antioch, but they're still called Christians. How did the Jews miss this? Well, well, they did. Behold, in verse 13, the days are coming, and they indeed have come. There's, there's not a future coming of the day of the Lord. It's already happened. When the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, uh, him who sow seed. Now, usually, you know, remember my days on the farm, you'd plow first, you'd plant, and then you'd reap. But this latter day here is going to be such that it's all happening at the same time. It's going to be so productive that it's all happening at the same time. The mountain shall drip with uh, sweet wine, and all the hill, hill shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and, and drink wine from them. That was always a symbol of peace. Uh, they shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them, and I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them says the Lord your God. And indeed, that is the case of the spiritual land of Israel that you cannot be uh, uh, pulled up from that land by someone else. But you can do it yourself. Yes, sir? You probably noticed this, but in Acts 15, we were discussing... Uh, yeah, when James, James mentioned James that. James posted it. So James. Had his own commentary, yeah. Oh. yeah, James quotes that, so... I know from that this is a messianic uh, portion of uh, the prophet. Well, it's uh, the bottom half of the hour, so I think we'll stop here and we'll begin with Hosea next time. Thank you.